Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome Michelle Maharbis from the University of California at Berkeley. He received his PhD from Berkeley and uh, his work led to the found, uh, foundation of microreactor technologies. Um, before uh, joining Berkeley, uh, Michelle was an assistant professor at the University of Michigan. Um, he's a serial entrepreneur. His current startup is Corterra Neurotechnologies, uh, focusing on implantable neural recording and stimulation devices. He's a Baker Fellow and is re recipient of a uh, NSF Career Award. He's also uh, known for developing the world's first remotely radio-controlled cyborg beetles. Uh, this was named one of the top 10 emerging technologies by uh, MIT Technology Review and was in Time Magazine's top 50 inventions. Um, his current research uh, interests including, include building micro-nano interfaces to cells and organisms and exploring bio-derived fabrication methods. Um, his long-term goal is to understand the developmental mechanisms as a way to engineer and fabricate machines. So with that, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, OK, I'm not going to talk about uh, bugs or microreactor or Corterra or anything like that. So uh, great, thankfully. Um, OK, so what I thought I would do, I'd like to do this more informal than a one-hour power talk, which I give often, and so it would very quickly depress me if I was just speaking at you for an hour. It would be nice if people interrupted and um, have more of a conversation. I know that there's time allotted at the end formally for questions, but if you feel like interrupting me, please do. It'll probably be more fun. So since it's a mixed crowd, what I thought I would do after one or two intro slides is give you a little, um, I don't know what I call it, tutorial. If you're in neuroscience, it's going to be very basic. But if you're not in neuroscience, um, it will help you understand uh, what it is we're trying to do and what some of the challenges are. And it's heavily cartoonized, but hopefully it will be useful to catch every, put everybody on the same page. So um, with that, let me, okay. So what I want to talk about is uh, this thing called neural dust, which um, we just published the first animal results in neuron in August, and there's sort of a history to how it, it came about, and we're pretty excited by and, and uh, is moving along pretty quickly. Um, I want to say that the work uh, that I'm going to talk about uh, goes up to uh, the work published uh, this August. At the end, I'm going to mention some new collaborators because this has grown uh, rather fast. Um, and so I'll mention those people at the end. But uh, the core work uh, was done with Jose Carmena's lab and Elad Alon and Jan Rabai, who many of you know um, are ASIC designers, uh, had a strong hand in it as well. So the four of us really um, uh, arranged it. And the, the, really, the two people most responsible in terms of actually doing it are DJ So, who's in my lab, and Ryan Neely, who's in Jose's lab. And so I just want to give credit uh, sort of where credit is due. So really quickly, though, let me pull all this up at once. This is really just um, for you to, I haven't even updated that slide because that's no longer in press. But just to give you an idea, so this slide I always put up because anyone giving a talk for an hour, if they're good enough talkers, can convince you of kind of close to anything. And it's always a good idea to go look at the papers and make sure you believe it. Um, the math for this was initially published in archive. Uh, and then we showed water tank experiments in uh, Jane Neuroscience Methods, um, followed by the animal data in Neuron. And in between, there's actually, there's actually more than this paper. There's a bunch of conference papers that you, where you can kind of see the tweaks that we're building. I mentioned this one because I'm going to come back to it at the end. Um, and there's a sort of a bunch of sprinkling of these kind of, of things along the way. So that's the actual publication record. Um, so let's. Let's dive into a little uh, kind of preload. So what, first of all, let me tell you what we were interested in when, when, you know, when I thought of this and kind of started developing it. Um, it really came out of a conversation with Jose Carmena, who does brain machine interfaces. So it did not come out of initially a conversation with someone that wants to do, for example, you know, high density recording of the brain. Um, I'll get to BMI or brain machine interfaces and prosthetics in a little bit, but basically what we wanted to do was build um, aggressive, very, very small uh, interfaces to record from the cortex. So you can think of, for example, the motor cortex, which is at the top of that, you know, near the surface where all the folds are. That's, that's the cortex up there. There's a bunch of other cool things about the brain, but that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in recording the cortex or uh, a peripheral nerve. So we wanted to record from locations of the peripheral nerve. And I'll, I want to walk you through some of the challenges um, in doing that and what some of the technology looks like before I show you neural dust, because I think it helps understand why we made the choices that we did. So first of all, by the way, um, I should say 
somewhat irresponsibly, I copied this from Google Images without attribution. I just realized, and same with that picture. It's just some random neuron picture from the web. Um, so this is a neuron, and many of you uh, know, even if you're not a neuroscientist, that um, one of the central sort of paradigms of modern neuroscience is that you know, as a result of what's happening at one end of a neuron, a, this nonlinear event will happen, which we call a spike or an action potential, which will then propagate down to the other side of the neuron, where there are many other processes, synapses and such, and they communicate then in some rather complex fashion, actually, to further downstream neurons. But this, this phenomenon, this action potential, is very well studied, of course, and uh, recording it capturing all of these action potentials in a vicinity of cortex, in an area of cortex, turns out to be powerful for many, many reasons. And so we're interested as a starting point, I'll broaden this out as we go, in trying to record this. Now, of course, this has been done for, for decades, and many, many big prizes um, have been awarded for people um, over the decades for doing this. But what you want to understand is that this is a, as this occurs, this occurs as a result of ions, ion channels opening and closing and shuttling ions in and out. And really what happens is you develop a chemical potential between the inside and the outside of the cell. That chemical potential can be read out, if you remember Faraday and Nernst, you can read that out as, a, as an electrical voltage, as, a, as an actual electrical potential, if you have access to the inside and the outside of the cell. Right? If you happen to be able to do that, you would be able to measure something like, and this varies, this is a cartoon, there, there are variants of this and all sorts of interesting features that change if you're a neuroscientist, but generally speaking, you know, tens of millivolts in the swing of some of these features in the spike. And so long ago, somebody said, well, how can I get, how can I get this recording? And the common way to do that exact recording, which is called intracellular recording or patch clamp, is to put an electrode that is a, a piece of metal that's mostly insulated except for the tip, on the outside of a cell, and then you try to get another one inside, how do you do that? Well, one method that is uh, tried and true is you take an extremely narrow capillary of glass and you bring it right up to the surface of the cell and you pull a little bit and pop a little bleb of that membrane, now you have ac continuous access. It turns out that that little ring makes a pretty good seal and then you have another electrode inside the capillary and now one electrode essentially sees electrically the inside of the cell, the other one's outside. And if you were to do this, you would get a beautiful intracellular recording. The problem is that for applications that have to do with trying to do this in people or in animals where you're trying to record awake behaving, you know, wake behavior, um, and you're trying to really build loops and do some sophisticated kind of VMI, this of course is very, 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 very difficult. Um, it's not easy to do this in more than one or, few, or more than N cells where N is a number less than 10 in vivo, and certainly, you know, when you're doing awake behavior, it's extremely hard. So long ago, somebody made another observation, which is, well, if I put both of the electrodes on the outside, I don't know why that came up, but it's always good to put Dice Ross' name, even though it has nothing to do with the slide. Uh, I don't know why that's there. Um, anyway, so uh, uh, another thing that somebody realized um, a long time ago is that if you put both electrodes on the outside, as a result of all this ion channel shuttling, you get essentially a whisper of that chemical potential reflected in the potentials that arise due to the occurrence on the outside of the cell. But this is a much, much smaller signal. So if you were actually to record this, you're talking about tens of microvolts maybe, and then it depends on how close and how far, and it depends how far those two electrodes are to each other, because in the limit as the two electrodes are in the same place, you get nothing, right? Those are the electrical engineers, that's obvious. Uh, and so you try to make these things far away. In fact, what you do is you take one of them and you make it really, really far away, you put it, you know, bolted onto the skull as some distant counter electrode, and then you have the electrode that's really close to the, the cell, and then you try to pick up these little signals. And you build nice amplifiers for them, and there's an entire community of people that build ASICs for this and, you know, do a really, really good job. So this is what's usually called extracellular electrophysiological recording, okay? Just, just for those of you that, like, have no clue, if I don't tell you this, then you wouldn't know what the hell I'm doing, basically, for the next 30 minutes. So, um, now the problem is not even that. The problem is that you're putting this in vivo, there's a lot of other cells around and they're all firing and unlike the intracellular case, you have no way of really separating this out. And so basically based on proximity, you will capture, you know, maybe if you're close to one neuron, you'll pick up something of the action potential of that neuron plus, depending on how close other neurons are and their processes, you may pick up superimposed, you know, stuff. 
And you might think, well, that'll all look like a bunch of little spikes of smaller amplitude, so I should be able to tell. And yes and no. So in fact, it's a, a subtle art, I would say, people that, that do those kind of measurements. Um, and there's a lot of information, some of which really was only appreciated over the, on the last decade. So for example, uh, you know, you might see a compound uh, action potential or something that's a multi, what's called multi-unit, so you have a couple of these things superimposing each other, but even the lower frequency stuff, the stuff that doesn't look like a spike, but you can tell if you look, if you were to watch it for a long time, you can tell that there are clear oscillations in this potential that are due to the ensemble of everything uh, firing these so-called uh, field potentials, even they are extremely interesting and being used to try to drive prosthetics and try to understand something about the brain. And there's all sorts of interesting neuroscience arguments about what the field potential is or isn't or what, what's causal and what's not causal. But you should understand, I mean, that, that's basically the milieu in which you're in when you're doing these recordings, okay? So today, I'll show you probes, but today, people microfabricate all sorts of fancy things to be that probe that goes into the cells, and then th that other one is some distant um, reference. On top of that, uh, there's organization. There's, there's some scale to what the uh, cortex is doing. A cortex is not just a spaghetti bowl of stuff that just happens to be willy-nilly you know, thrown in there. There's a spatial organization to this. So um, it's, this is very, very stereotyped. This particular picture is a reconstruction. And again, I don't know, in this case, there was an attribution, so I apologize. But this is from a very nice paper where they do a reconstruction of the rat uh, barrel cortex which is a particular uh, part of the cortex in the rat. And in, in that particular animal, in that particular region, it's actually beautiful in how you know, nice it looks. You can debate whether, like say, in the human uh, motor cortex, it looks this beautiful. But the argument more or less holds, which is that you have not just uh, you know, in layers to what the, where different, neuron con, different neurons are doing different things, integrating information from lots of neurons and so on, but you also have them arranged in these uh, almost columns these cortical columns, so-called, which um, set a basic sort of spatial um, scale to what's going on. And this will become important in a minute, because as part of my tutorial, I do want to tell you, kind of give you a sense for different recording modalities, again, so you understand why, where neural dust fits in. So there is a, you, you can see a scale. So just as a ballpark, you can assume that the column to column spacing is on order of millimeter. Millimeter, two millimeters, millimeter, half, whatever. But it's that order that you're talking about on the arrangement of these things. OK, so now, how do we take electrical recordings uh, from the brain? There's lots of different uh, modalities. This is a very famous uh, picture from a Schwartz 2006 paper. Today, today, apparently, all my attributions have disappeared. I, I'm, I'm, I'm being a very bad academic. I really apologize. I don't know why they're not coming up. So anyway, Schwartz uh, 2006 has this really pretty uh, picture that has been used in many, many talks by lots and lots of people. Um, and what it captures is, um, kind of what I just told you, but you can see how it relates to all the different electrical technologies that have been used to record. So at the very highest spatial scale and temporal scale is the single unit action potential recording, which I just described. I, I put an electrode near some neuron, and I will try to record very fast you know, features, spikes, which occur, you know, the, the, they'll occur you know, on anything from 10 to 100. Uh, to maybe even a kilohertz, and so that they can go very fast. And the, uh, to capture all of the features in that, you know, you probably need something. I was just debating this with Tom Daniels this morning at breakfast. You probably need something at 25 kilohertz. Some people argue you need 40 if you're looking at timing issues. Okay, so that's kind of the bandwidth you're talking about if you're trying to capture all of that. Then, you know, if you're in a, if you're, if you're not good enough or you're not interested in all that high frequency stuff and you just want to ca capture some the lower frequency ensemble stuff, that's the field potential. Then if you go up one layer, uh, you can take an array of electrodes and slap them over the cortex. So you pop, you know, you do a craniectomy and you lay the sheet of stuff over the cortex. And there what you're doing it, to first order, there's actually subtlety, but to first order what you're doing is you're picking up uh, the large fields generated by these cortical columns, because these cortical columns have a certain spatial organization, and as the big uh, pyramidal cells do what they do and they integrate all this information, you essentially get dipoles that exist, and you can detect that on these grids. And so there, usually, you know, historically, these uh, electrocorticography grids, as they're called, ECOGs, are, were millimeters and millimeters. You know, so initially, they were centimeters, and then they were millimeters and millimeters. And uh, there was a debate that's more or less starting to be resolved about, you know, if I make them really, really, really small, like if I make 100 micron ECOG spacing and electrode size, would I pick anything up or is it all, you know, sort of oversampling because the, those signals only exist on one millimeter spacing and it turns out 
there's a subtlety there, you can pick up interesting signals. But that's ECOG. So ECOG is I take a grid, two by two grid, and I slap it over the cortex. You could do something similar in the periphery. So in fact, there's an analog to these three in the periphery. If you're interested in peripheral cells, I can go in and go into the, the, the nerve bundle. So if I take a, a nerve, it's got an epineurium, that's the sort of shrink wrap of the nerve, and then inside you've got all of these uh, processes. Sometimes they're sub-bundled as well. And so I can go in there and go in and try to leave something in there to record to try to capture individual processes. Or I might want to just wrap something around the nerve, maybe ECOG-like, it's not called ECOG, but it's the same principle, and try to pick up sort of collected compound activity. And all this is interesting if you're trying to build prosthetics, you know, you can use them for different applications. Lastly, EEG, which everybody, you know, there's always some new paper about somebody that did something funky with EEG. EEG is I'm outside the skull entirely, and I'm picking up the collected oscillations, the electric field created by all these oscillations of many, many cells. So EEG is like, in the analogy here, is like you're, you're near the stadium, and you get close enough that you can hear the roar of the crowd, and they're all singing, you know, whatever the UW, uh, you know, football song is. And you can't tell what anybody's saying, but I can tell they're all doing that, right? Or maybe the left half is arguing with the right half in some sort of battle of of, of songs or something. That's more or less what EEG is. So it's good at attention because attention changes, engage the whole brain, and it's good at sleep and stuff like that. Okay, so is that a reasonable, uh, super fast tutorial on uh, electrophysiology recording? Anybody want us 30 seconds? Is anything, because then I'm gonna just launch into showing you pictures of probes and neural dust and all that. We're good? All right, everyone seems to be either um, slightly bored or happy, um, okay. So if you're building these things, what do you care about? You care about, you want to see the signal that you want. It's important to figure out, this is why I'm giving you this whole lecture, is it's important to what, what you care, what you care about for whatever it is you're doing, whether you're doing fundamental neuroscience or a prosthetic for the medical uh, field, you know, you, you, you really want to be clear on what you care about. You want to distinguish, you know, as best you can, but the real problem are really bullet points three and down. The big outstanding problem, and this is, this is a huge problem in the field, it remains a problem. Neural dust is the beginning of a solution. The problem is you build these interfaces, these probes, whatever you want to call them, you put them in and they don't last, okay? That's it, they just all go bad. And I'll, I'll walk you through why they go bad, but they all go bad. Um, so the problem, when you, the problem is that they go bad, you know, at best on order of five or six years, that's at best. Most academic type things go bad way earlier than that. And why is that? Well, okay, two reasons, or two meta reasons. There's a whole community of people that argue about this, but the two cartoon meta reasons are, one, if I told you I'm gonna make an, a, an ASIC, I'm gonna make a silicon chip, I'm gonna throw it in the ocean, and it's gotta work in the ocean for 20 years without a ceramic encapsulant of any kind, nobody would think that's reasonable, right? Like, why would you think that's reasonable? But for some reason, the probe field, you know, I would keep doing this and then be like, well, I don't know why it's going bad. Well, it's going bad because you're implanting into a bag of salt water with a lot of other active processes and you're getting insulator delamination, you're getting water vapor penetration, you're getting all sorts of failure modes uh, at the thin film or encapsulate level that then just contribute to everything going bad. On the other hand, when you go into the biology, you're destroying the biology, so you're doing the opposite thing, right? One thing you should have in your heads is that the more um, innervated the particular region of the brain or the nervous system is, usually the more vascularized it is. So like your cortex is a bed of absolutely dense capillaries. And when you put in spike you know, probes, what I'm about to show you, penetrating probes, you're like essentially microembolism, like pop, 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 pop. You know, I had a, a friend of mine who called it the hamburger helper solution, so you're <laughs> right? And that's not fair, but the point is that when you're coming through, you are damaging vasculature. And when you damage vasculature, that has to heal, that causes systemic response, things are recruited, you get encapsulation, and all this other stuff. La the, the other, that's not the whole story. The other thing is if you have wires, and many people here at UW, is one of the reasons I came here, know all about this and have been working uh, and coming up with great solutions for this. I mean, if you have wires, uh, you have a route for infection, whether that's the nervous system or anything else. And it doesn't matter what they tell you about, you know, the wire is embedded in a plug of goop and it's solid. That's all, eventually, most of these animals are on heavy doses of antibiotics, okay? Um, and, eventually, and at the end, the last point is, uh, whatever you do, for, certainly for what we're interested in, we want to allow awake, untethered behavior. You don't want to have some animal walking around with some giant dongle stuck to its head. So really quick, uh, hopefully this didn't ruin anybody's uh, lunch, but well, you haven't had lunch yet, so you're fine. So 
I'll show you a couple of pictures of things, and then we'll start talking about neural dust. This is an e these are ECOGs, just so you see. Some of these are from my lab. In fact, almost all of them are from my lab, except for that middle one there. That is an actual open head, and there's a c commercial grade large scale ECOG sitting over the cortex. Um, these are all micro uh, scale. Uh, this is actually published now. These are older, the two, two years old. But anyway, these are all, you can see what they're doing. They're all laying over the cortex. You can see the vasculature underneath, and they're recording from that. These are penetrating probes just so you have a sense of what these look like. This is an assortment of things. It, it comes from this really nice paper from 2010 that just had a, a bunch of really nice pictures and a really nice review of them. But again, gives you a sense. These things are all pushed into the cortex. Um, some are just wires. They're just insulated wires where the tips are flamed open. Um, that's about to go into a brain. That's probably a rat brain by the look of it. Um, yeah, or a macaque, actually. Um, anyway, and then uh, some have are silicon and they're fancy and they have multiple little electrodes. Uh, the one of the standards these days are the IMEC probes. So they're coming out of IMEC and they have built-in amplifiers, really gorgeous technology that has um, lots and lots of probes. An example of something earlier like this, you know, just to show you what a what a the sort of the opposite of neural dust is. It's a shank. It's about a millimeter long. And these things are on order of 30 to 50 microns wide. And you can see lots and lots of little exposed electrodes. Each of them are recording. And you can see, for example, that near these, there's obviously you know, a neuron. And there's another neuron near these, and so on. And so this is recording all of its vicinity. And you try to make inferences about what's going on. All right, so this is kind of where the state of the art um, was. And just so you understand, uh, those of you, again, that, that, that aren't in this field, this has been done uh, through the BrainGate trials. Yeah. Boop, 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 boop. Uh, yeah. There? The, this one. E. Uh, that's just actually close in. So E is either a close up of D, or it's actually a, a slightly different technology. It might be the Michigan stuff where it's, I don't remember, but where they're, they're 2D slabs of silicon. They're made with, and then they're layered. I can, we can, I, you find me after the talk, I'll look up what E is, or you can go to the paper. My guess is um, they're, no, they're sharp enough. I mean, yeah, those look more, more interesting because they seem to have tips, and so they look like they might penetrate. But at these scales, you know, that stuff will go in just fine. By the way, good, good thing. So what's the scale of these? You know, the wires can be down to, you know, in terms of common use where you can buy it off the store, 16, 20 microns. Those kind of things are easy to buy. They, they, people make them for you, hand assembled. The fabricated ones range all over the place. So they, they can be very big if you're trying to put a lot of stuff on there. They can be you know, 100 microns wide. They can be very small. It really depends on, on who's making them and what you're doing. So as part of the BrainGate trials, you know, th this um, uh, technology, penetrating probes, was um, introduced into humans. And um, brain-machine interface prosthetic experiments were performed. And um, it, these were done with the Utah array, which is the, I, I don't think arguably, absolutely the most successful of these technologies that's sort of been put into broad use. Um, <clears throat> and so this, that's what the array looks like. And it was worked into a very nice um, you know, sort of prosthetic that bolts onto the skull. You can kind of see what these things look like. And these are recording from the cortex. And then they were used to demonstrate a variety of BMI tasks using effector arms. And for the people that are involved in this, I mean, if you ever have a chance to see the videos, they're on YouTube. You can you see how remarkable it is just at an emotional level. They, they, can, they can train themselves to do this. Um, but these things, you should be aware, these things do not last very long. I mean, the reality is that you know, five or six years in, you know, there was a talk I just saw by John Donahue like a year ago. And you, you know, the, the recordable units start to disappear. I mean, you just can't. They start to drop off. And after a while, there's just not very much. There, aren't very, there are very few of those electrodes left that can report anything useful. So as a result, people went to wireless or you know, started investing in all sorts of wireless. And you, know, you can imagine going from something like this to something where you have an ASIC, and that ASIC can do lots of channel recording, and it's connected to some sort of antenna, and that can communicate out through the skull, and so on. And there have been a variety of um, uh, approaches to this. Like I said, you know, a number of them here at UW. The ones that are up there are from Berkeley, because I'm from Berkeley. Um, and you know, they all are a variant of, I have an implantable shank or an implantable thing. I'm going to have a front end that's going to be very small, so it can fit in whatever space I care about. And those front ends are going to be linked to some communication protocol, RF, almost certainly, uh, that will have a coil. And it'll try all sorts of different schemes to get data in and out. And as a rough ballpark, 
The lowest power we've ever seen from anybody, just to give you a sense of what you could do if you're aggressive, is on order of microwatts per channel you're recording, and hundreds of microns on a side for the full package per channel. And that includes a full you know, rectification and front end amplification loop and all the things you would need to record. Those numbers are important because when I show you stuff, you want to keep them kind of in the back of your head. So people were, were are um, pushing sort of in this direction, okay? so. As of this slide, now we're gonna start talking about neural dust. Is that all make sense? Any questions like, like his, kind of calibrate, curiosity driven or otherwise? I think I'm doing okay on time, so I wanna make sure that everybody's on the same page, particularly because they're students. No? We're good? Okay. So, I started getting obsessed with this idea that's been around for a, a while, which is, could you build ridiculously small implants? So forget about what I just showed you. What if I could build a 100 micron object? The whole thing was 100 microns and I could put it into the cortex, close everything up, and talk to it from the outside. Could I put it into a nerve, make a 100 micron object, put it into a nerve, close everything up, and talk to it from the outside? And so, starting about four years ago, we started looking at this, first with uh, two of Jan Rabai's students, um, who we asked, you know, would this be feasible with RF, with electromagnetics? You know, and, and we told them, you can go up to whatever frequency you want, you know, 100 gigahertz if you want, whatever you want. Just, would it be reasonable to build such a system um, where we could get power coupling in and out. And the, the sort of rough, um, or the, the, the simple but, but true sort of cartoon representation is I'm gonna have some resonator, call it a resonator, a coil, an energy capture device, whatever you want, something with an aperture that's going to be inside the tissue, uh, the body, the skull, the brain, the nerve, and it'll have some, you know, obviously some associated intelligence and little circuit. And then outside there'll be a, a corresponding um, uh, interrogator which can be any size you want. Uh, matched and so on, and then some drive. And the problem is, if you do it with RF, you find that that solution works well at the centimeter scale and higher, really well. You can do lots of cool things. As you start to make the, the, receive, uh, the receive side smaller and smaller and smaller, uh, you start to fall off a cliff. Uh, the y-axis is log. You start to fall off a cliff below about, I don't want to say, a millimeter. And the reason for this is actually very straightforward. So y-axis, by the way, is link efficiency. So if you build one of these models and you ask how efficient am I at, say, um, coupling power. The, the problem is actually very straightforward. It's due to two things that are just physics. The first is that the speed of light is very fast. Light is very fast, speed of light is very high. And so if you remember your basic physics, what that means is that the wavelength at a particular frequency is actually rather large. So if you're building a, an energy capture device, an antenna, whatever you want to call it, a resonator, the size of that resonator is usually on order of lambda, lambda over two, lambda over four, some appreciable fraction of lambda, which means that, that if lambda is big, that's a big object. So it gets hard if you're forcing to build something really small. The person that's done the most amazing work in this is Ada Poon, I think, at Stanford, who really looked at like, how you can push the envelope there. But you're kind of fighting physics. Um, the other one is simply that your bags of salt water, so am I, and so if you try to push electromagnetics through bags of salt water, the absorption is horrible. This is why submarines don't communicate with high frequency or your cell phone doesn't work underwater. And what it means from a medical perspective is that it's very, there's a very tight constraint on the sort of density of power you can send in because if you go past that, you assume, it's a very simple model, but everybody follows it, that you're gonna heat up the tissue by a degree or so. So there's a cap on how much power you can send in, and here's the number right here. If you put all that together using this model, you find that for a, you know, a millimeter squared external interrogator, a 100 micron implant two millimeters away, these two things are two millimeters away from each other, you're talking about picowatts. And that's, I mean, that's just not a lot of power. Maybe that's a challenge to some of you that are really cowboy uh, uh, circuit designers, but it's not a lot of power. Uh, if you are an electrical engineer and you appreciate decibels, um, here's the same information, but, uh, on the, y, on the y axis is the resonant frequency you'd be operating at for that size of implant. Um, and the uh, right y axis is the link efficiency in decibels. And the only point I want to make is that for a 100 micron object, it's a 64 dB single trip loss or 128 dB round trip, which is crazy, right? That's a really, really bad loss. You can barely hear anything. Okay, so this is a hard problem. What works really well is ultrasound. So um, this is the aha. I mean, the, the, the aha of neural dust is don't build it with um, EM, build it with ultrasound, and then let's look at where it breaks. Let's look at our entitlements. And so how does this work? So it's actually, it's a, you know, for those of you that work on backscatter, 
uh, it's just a backscatter system. So what you do is you take a piezoelectric crystal, say for starters, uh, PZT, lead zirconium titanate, and what does a piezoelectric uh, crystal do? Well, uh, if you uh, apply a pressure to it, if you mechanically deform it, either compressive or tensile, you do something to it, and you happen to have electrodes on this, on the two surfaces of this, you know, sort of uh, on either side of, uh, of where you're compressing it, you will get uh, electrical potential. And in fact, if you have a load on there, you can deliver power. So a piezoelectric crystal can transduce mechanical to electrical and the, the, by symmetry the inverse. It can do electrical to mechanical, okay? So if I apply voltages on it, I can actually get mechanical deformations. This has been known since the early part of the 20th century and it's what the crystals and, you know, crystal watches and timing, all this stuff is very, very well known. So I'm gonna put a crystal uh, that is bulk, that means it's a, it's a slab of this crystal and it's lambda over two. Because if I make it lambda over too thick, the normal mode will mean it'll resonate at lambda, right? If you just do a quick in your head kind of a, a reflection in very simple. So it'll resonate if I make it lambda over too thick. So I'm gonna put that implant into the body. Close everything up and I'm gonna put an ultrasound emitter on the outside. I'm gonna launch an ultrasonic wave. What's gonna happen? The ultrasonic wave is gonna go through the tissue gonna hit the piezo crystal and reflect back. Okay, so I'll see a reflection. Now that in itself is not all that interesting. That's called imaging. And uh, well, that's not even imaging, you know, I just see the reflection. And so I would see, oh, there's something there that's you know, mechanically different impedance than the jello around it, and so I'm getting a bright signal. That's fine, so, so we see it. The trick here is, can I build a circuit and that's this uh, little, d shown here you know, cartoonishly as a variable resistor. Can I, show, can I build a circuit such that as a function of the extracellular voltage, remember we talked about that as a function of the extracellular voltage, that circuit can modulate the current that it wants, to, its impedance, right? The current that it wants to draw out of the crystal. Can it modulate its impedance as a function of the firing of the extracellular? If it does, the fact that I can modulate the impedance of the thing connected in par parallel to the piezo means that I'm mo modulating the entire impedance of that object. And because a piezo is, n is a mechanical electrical transducer, if I modulate the impedance of all of that electrically, I'm going to modulate the mechanical impedance, which means the amount reflected is going to change. So that means that encoded in the reflection will be little changes which are, tel are literally from which I can reconstruct the, electrical, the, uh, the neural signal. Does that make sense as a cartoon sketch? That, that's it, that's all neural dust is. The rest is all bells and whistles and where it breaks and you know, the math about my entitlements and then pictures of animals with things in their sides and stuff like that. So that, that is um, essentially what dust is. Okay, we're good? So actually let me, let me jump ahead before I do this. Do I have the numbers? Yeah, so let me, I'm gonna jump ahead and then jump back. So if you do this, just a quick, the short version is if you do this, you find that you see the red curve is what I showed you before for EM. The blue curve is what you get when you build a, a link, a backscatter link out of ultrasound. It's just much, much better. So, you know, a 10 megahertz ultrasound, as an example, lambda is 150 microns, versus in EM, 10 gigahertz gives you five millimeters. So, so you're, you picked up advantage one. And the loss is just way different because ultrasound is not absorbed heavily uh, by your body, right? I mean, it's absorbed, there's, there's a certain absorption and, and the number you wanna keep in the back of your head is about half a decibel per centimeter per megahertz in soft tissue like brain. And in bone, of course, it's higher. And peripheral tissue is somewhere in between, but closer to here. It's very low loss, that's beautiful. That means you just don't lose a lot, while you're, other than isotropic loss, you just don't lose a lot while you're going through the tissue. And so that's why that blue curve, even at ridiculous sizes like that 100 microns, look pretty good. Okay, so. Uh, this, uh, that's the part I skipped. So this calculation assumes a, I'll get, hang on, I'm gonna tell you exactly where we are. We're at one Raleigh, that's the short answer, but, but I'll. So the, this calculation assumes uh, you're building a link model, you have some transmission line model ultrasound for your tissue, you, can ca you calculate propagation loss, and then, and here's the trick, we assume that we are one Raleigh or farther, Right, so we don't deal with near changes in sort of the subtleties of near field uh, reflection and sort of changes in the field due to, because the problem with the near field, you know this very, very well, right? If I move too far into the near field, the fact that I have something there begins to kind of change all of the, the, the in this case would be the pressure distributions and EM would be the field distributions. If you go kind of one Raleigh and farther, you can make certain assumptions about, about what you have.
We did, so I have to remember, so when we did this actually as we are uh, changing the Rx dimension um, for a fixed uh, distance between them, we actually do transition and it includes, it transitions to a near field calculation appropriately. Yeah, and so what's, what's missing, you know, uh, there is asking essentially what the, their two millimeter transmission distance. So I could do other plots at different distances and then you'd be right, you'd start to get different skews to it, right? But it, this does appropriately say like over here, I'm in the near field over there and so on. Or actually over here, I'm in the near field and over there, I'm in the far field. Um, and then this is the one Raleigh question about the ultrasound. So what, <clears throat> this is a detail, but I thought I'd tell you, you, you wanna park this ideally at one Raleigh distance, which is sort of, you can think of it as a boundary between the near field and the far field. Because if you're in the near field, you get efficiency drops, uh, at least naively, uh, because of the near field effects. And if you're in the far field, the moment you start wandering too far, you're losing energy because it's sort of isotropic loss, right? So you're just capturing less and less of the energy. So ideally, you wanna tune your external interrogator aperture so that for however deep you want it, you're at one Raleigh distance. That's a technical detail for those of you that like ultrasound. Um, I'll skip this, this is, uh, we can talk about that. This is all about mode, the different modes in a cube. If you care, I can come back to it later. Um, and so the short version is that um, you get really nice power. You get hundreds of microwatts, and I'll show you this, but I mean, you get really nice power numbers delivered to this thing with the ultrasound. It's just a really good way there's nothing else you remember. It's a really good way of coupling power to small objects in the body, it just is. And it's no different, if you're an electrical engineer, switching to doing ultrasound is no, you know, if you're build, building backsetter systems your whole life, like, there's nothing particularly interesting about this, quite frankly. You, know, you can do, you just do a mode switch and you're just building them out of crystals instead of antennas. Um, now, where does this break? It breaks uh, in, in, this is why the tutorial was necessary. So now think about a dust mode. I'm gonna record, I haven't told you how I'm doing it, but I'm gonna have two electrodes, right? I can't have a distant counter electrode, some people call it ground, it's not really a ground, but a distant, it can't have the distant ground, as the neuroscientists like to say. I have, they're both on that moat. As the moat shrinks in size, the delta in voltage on those uh, of electrodes is shrinking, and it's shrinking, it's, cr it's crapping out very fast, it's roughly speaking exponentially. And so the first problem you're gonna have is that, is that as the cube gets smaller, those two little square electrodes are getting closer and closer to each other, the total voltage difference gets smaller. The other problem is that any electrode has a finite impedance, um, and if you have a finite impedance, you have thermal noise, which you can calculate, right? Depending on how much averaging you're doing or whatever, you can calculate your thermal noise. And so the thermal noise is gonna give us also some sort of hard stop. And so this was in the archive paper, well, the reason I show this is because I wanna cull any conversations about well, are you ever gonna build a 20 nanometer dust? Like the answer is no. And the reason is that the blue curve is sort of the power curve I've been showing you over and over as I make the moat smaller, except now it's an absolute power just to make it easier to, to make the point. Your dashed red curve is the, the absolute minimum that you would need uh, to hear that ever diminishing whisper of voltage as you bring these things closer. And if you wanna have an SNR of three, it's actually the green curve, and that's really the real one because the, you're never gonna operate at the noise limit, that's silly. So you're gonna be at, you know, a bit higher. And where those two curves intersect, you're done. Left of that, there is less power than you need to make this work. And if you were to cheat, and I can tell you how you can cheat in a minute, uh, you would still run into an electrode thermal noise limit at some point. So you can see just from the scale that that's in the tens of microns, okay? So that, that's the, the reason I show this slide. And that's where, uh, I'm gonna show you millimeter scale results now, but if you wanna know what I, my, what I wanna do is I wanna get it to 100 microns in the next year or so, maybe say a couple of years, oh, my grad students' heads will explode, because you know, professors always overpromise when they're giving talks, and then you go back and they're like, what did you say? It's gonna be like two years before we get this to work at best. Anyway, we wanna go for 100 microns, and I think that will, I think that'll revolutionize a lot of stuff. So now this is gonna, uh, if you're an ASIC designer, this is gonna hurt. Uh, so we built an extremely sophisticated circuit. Uh, the way that we record uh, the extracellular potential in today's neural dust is really, really complex. It is a single FET, right there. And so what you do, and I have to say, I, it bewilders me to this day that this works. Um, and people like Ricky Muller who gave a talk here, I think it makes her head explode altogether. And so I'll tell you about what we're doing with Ricky at the end of the talk. We're definitely building other systems. But the basic thing I'm gonna show you is you take a FET 
And the gate of the FET becomes one of the electrodes in the solution. And then you connect a drain in the source to the two terminals of the piezo. You cannot use the source as the counter electrode because then you would get current flowing between the two and you can't run current through the tissue. So what you do is you just put two match resistors between the drain and the source and you pick off the middle. And because the piezo is an AC voltage with no DC offset, that effectively acts as a virtual counter. And then you run that over and that's the, the other counter electrode. That is the whole circuit. It is taped out because we need our own custom gigantic transistors to do gigantic being, you know, in the microns. Uh, but that's it. And then what we do is, what, what you'll see when I show you an ASIC, <laughs> it's just that, okay? And so what's happening is little changes in the unbiased, there's no DC bias on the gate. Little changes on the gate will modulate super tiny changes in the IDS current. As that current is modulated, you are modulating essentially the impedance of what this looks like in parallel with the piezo, which in turn modulates the impedance of the piezo, as I promised. So could you please elaborate on how V neural is acting on this fact? Like yeah, so what's the connection? Yeah, so basically the V neural one terminal is on the gate and the other is on this point right here. So effectively what's happening is I'm just ch making tiny little, you know, 100 microvolts or millivolt changes on the gate of this thing relative to this point which, you know, you can think of as essentially a, a fixed counter ground point. And so all that does is it modulates IDS through the fit. And, and those two terminals are spaced, whatever. Yeah, the, you'll see them in a minute in the real. I'm about to show you all the real devices. But that, these two terminals, one electrode is here and one the other one's there, this whole story. Okay, cool. So we, when we first built these, what we did is we built them in little boards so that we could test them. So here's a crystal. We wanted to build uh, lots of different sizes of crystals and look at our entitlements. And, um, and then basically uh, put these in, this is the whole system here put the, the Fed on the other side and put them in a water tank and see what we could get. And I'm gonna go a little quicker here. I think I have about five, 10 minutes left, but I think that's plenty. So uh, here's a water tank and you know, you can, this is all pretty common sense, but I wanna kind of show you how we do it. So you put this in, you have little pickouts so that you can receive through an RX amp and an oscilloscope and then you're sending in ultrasonic pulses. Alternatively, uh, the, the, the one that's closer to what you'd actually do is you send and then you have an RX TX switch and then you receive. So you send and then you wait for the re yellow reflections and you receive and all along you can play games with biasing it here just so that we can uh, test this thing out. So that, those are the early ones. And the, the reason I show this is I say most times when you write a paper, you, you have a vague idea of the theory, you take a bunch of data and then you, then you go back and retroactively show how the theory is miraculously matching your data, right? That's the usual paradigm. And we published this blue curve in archive and then we took the data a year later and published it and it's kind of remarkable, you know, all the way down to 125 micron sized crystals, how uh, good, the, you know, accurate the math is in terms of predicting really what you're entitled to in terms of efficiency. And these things um, do resonate, but they're heavily dequeued because they're sitting in this, you know, kind of gelatinous environment in the, in the body and in water, it's just enough of a damper. So this matters, uh, we'll talk about this later, but this matters if you care about frequency binning. These are fairly broad, you can kind of see what the, just by observation, kind of what the bandwidth is, it's pretty huge off the center, right? It's a very low Q. Okay, um, let me skip this in a minute. This is just more water tank stuff that shows that we would be able to measure it. In the interest of time, let me just show you what we did. So these are the moats as were implanted for the August paper. So um, these are uh, polyimid backplanes. That's the amber stuff. Um, here you can see the scale bar here. Uh, I'll show you the newer ones uh, a little bit later. Uh, here's the piezo, it's right there. Um, this is the ASIC with our amazing circuit. And, and then on the back side, uh, to your question, these are the two recording pads. And they are, um, uh, platinum plated and then P dot plated or one or the other. These days we, we have some that are, we only P dot plate, some that we drop platinum on. I mean, it's just all the standard electro stuff. They um, are made with two, uh, sorry, four long leads that look like spaghetti. And that's so that when we first implant them, we could take direct measurements of the electrodes, literally directly wired measurements so that we could do point to point comparisons, right? Um, it also allows us to look directly at the power on the crystal if we're doing tuning or whatever. The back end stuff is actually the, uh, you know, a lot of work. So I, I focus on the implant, but this back end, uh, as it is stood for the neuron paper, was an FPGA with a custom ASIC that was used to drive the external transducer and switch. So this is a beautiful chip that was built by Bernhard Boser's chip, uh, Bernhard Boser's group at Berkeley, and it does just really nice uh, send and receive switching. So the entire system, what used to be oscilloscopes and all that stuff I showed you is reduced to this whole board and out here you connect your transducer. And I'll show you the next iteration of that as well at the end of the talk. 
So let's see, I've got 10 minutes, I think. So this is uh, one of these things sitting on a sciatic nerve of a rat, and it's sutured. If you look real close, I don't know the resolution, but you, you can see little suture wires right there and so on, and they're kind of stuck on. But this is all graduate student surgery on a rodent. Um, I'm going to go through this in a minute because I do think it's worth understanding how we do it in case you have better ideas or, or you like thinking about this. And then what I'll do is I'll show you the, the data and we'll kind of wrap up with what we're doing now. So the way we do this is um, imagine that this, as a reference, this top thing is just a reference for the rest of the plot. This is what you would record if you picked off the electrical potential from wires off of a sciatic nerve compound action potential. So if this is larger, you know, it's a good millivolt, and it's the compound action potential of the whole nerve firing. And you can see that you kind of get a classic, if you know what these look like, this is sort of classic uh, action potential. I'll show you more of that data in a minute. But what we do is every 100 microseconds, we send out six chirps, okay? So this is it, pop, 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 pop on the transducer. And then we wait for those to return. And what happens is if you look at, if you switch to receive and you're looking on the receive channel, this is all crossover garbage from the transmit, so this doesn't matter. And then you have this stuff, which you then remove all the low frequency stuff and you get this packet. This is actually that packet once you get rid of this curve. And this packet here looks like that. I'll come back to it in a minute. So then what you're gonna do is you're gonna rectify this, you're gonna integrate the area under some of these spikes, and you will then from that back out what the voltage would have been at the, at the piezo, at the ASIC, and call it you know, that data point. And by doing this continuously, every 100 microseconds, you can build up a curve, and this curve is the reconstructed version of that curve, okay? Now, if you look here, the way this works is uh, when you get reflections back, you don't just get the reflections back from the piezo because there's multiple interfaces. You get packets back that come from reflections on the board itself, the, the, the polyimid. And that actually matters because both the non-responsive and the piezo uh, packets will change with orientation, but only the piezo packet will change with neural signal. And that's useful for disambiguating things like motion artifact. Although it's not the whole story, it's kind of a nice built-in reference because you can look at both of these things and normalize on the fly. And so the, the, the packets in the middle here are the ones that have the biggest change. And then if you care about noise floor, as of the the time of this slide, we had about 180 microvolt noise floor with this system, and now it's down to about 100 with a couple of tricks that we did on the back end. Um, but that's probably about the limit. If you, we're currently building a system that'll go down to 10 microvolts, and it's slightly different. I'll talk about that in a minute. Those of you that do ultrasound, uh, the beauty of this system is that it is ridiculously low power, particularly if you like to uh, focus ultrasound. I, there you are, I was trying to phase lock with you. Uh, the powers that you're emitting are extremely low, and so it's nice because you don't have to worry about it. It also means that you have a lot of uh, power budget to play with. We could crank this up if we wanted to, okay? All right, so I'll come back to that if there are questions. Now, very quickly, for those of you that do this stuff, here is EMG data and then compound action potential data, and, and basically the EMG, we put it in a muscle, and the uh, compound action potential, we put it on the sciatic nerve. And very quickly, this plot, is the actual uh, gold standard wire recording. This is the classic wire recording you would do for ever increasing electrical stimulation distal to the place we're recording. So basically stimulate the leg and get it to twitch. And the higher, the harder and harder we stimulate, the event, at first nothing happens, then you recruit more and more, eventually you recruit the whole muscle. And you get, you know, this is typical sigmoidal recruitment curve as a function of stim intensity. But the cool part is, this is the gold standard, this is what the neural dust reconstruction is, and these two are the errors. This is in the neuron paper if you want to examine it closely later, because you're not going to be able to do it too much. But, but it works really, really nicely, actually. There's a little bit of this uh, phase shift here, which we're not quite sure what it is, to be honest, and it only shows up in muscle. It doesn't show up in the nerve signal. But it, it's really, really nice. And we get a, a 10 kilohertz uh, effective sampling rate with our system. The wired one was done much higher. And then if you do uh, the nerve, which is, that's the sciatic nerve up there. We put the implant like I showed you. Again, really beautiful correspondence between a compound action potential and the gold standard. And here you see the, the overlay, and this is the, um, the, the difference error, and again, sigmoidal recruitment all measured with dust. So it works, and it works really, really nicely, okay? So now, to kind of wrap up, and then give you time to ask questions or whatnot. Let me tell you where, we, where we're going and kind of what, there's a lot to be done in this space, obviously. So the first thing is we now have much smaller moats. So our, our, our newer moats are a millimeter total size and the even newer moats that will probably show up around November, December are made on silicon and those will be this size and smaller. So we're, we're pushing the envelope down to get smaller moats. 
that comes with its operational challenges, which you can ask me about. Um, a big challenge, this is in the neuron paper, is not that we can't tell uh, that there's either lateral misalignment or rotational misalignment. That you, can, you can normalize that out, as I explained very quickly. The problem is that the absolute amount of power drops rather drastically, and so the total signal reflected is dropping by that amount, which means that the effective noise floor, because at some point I just can't see that, that PPM difference on the signal, the effective noise floor becomes really bad once you wander beyond a millimeter of misalignment, if I do it this way. So I'll tell you how we're solving it, but if I do it this way. So what we've done is um, we're, we've, we're in the process now of building a, a rodent wearable backpack that'll do awake behavior. This is the transducer uh, element, multi-element transducer array, and this is a, the, the board sort of miniaturized and sort of put onto the back of a rat. But the goal here, and this is something I'm, I'm not gonna talk too much about because it's pre-publication, but it turns out that actually using something that can beam steer plus some clever machine learning that does feature extraction and clustering, you can actually improve this drastically to the point where it becomes a non-issue because the way we were doing it was very naive. We were looking at integrating areas under the curve and throwing away the rest of the information, whereas if you collect all of the information and do some very clever clustering, you can actually pick out all the data that exists in that backscatter and you can actually um, really handle um, multiple modes and misalignment very robustly. So. Um, let me just put this up. That's just a pretty picture of the beam steering. But where we're going right now uh, in very rough terms is smaller dust. We now have barium titanate crystals instead of uh, lead zirconium titanate so that uh, um, they're biocompatible. Uh, we're changing our total material stack, including the encapsulants, which I didn't have time to talk about. Uh, beam steering, we uh, are spinning an ASIC as we speak. It should tape out very soon which will lower the noise floor down to about 10 microvolts if everything works, which means I'll be able to do single action potential recording. Uh, and uh, Ricky Muller is uh, working uh, with us. Uh, uh, I think she gave a talk here a couple weeks ago. So Ricky's working on a stimulation ASIC. She's an a, a amazing circuit designer, so I have no doubt that we'll have a simulation moat on order of 12 months when that ASIC gets back and is tested and is integrated into the same framework. So the idea there is you know, we send in the power and it's used to stimulate. Um, but this is actually only the tip of the iceberg, and I'm gonna leave you with, um, this is just, I'll come back to this just to give props to Bernhard's group, but the big picture I think actually extends beyond neural recording. Because anything you can put on the front end of this thing, any, any sensor you can think of, you can, you can now build essentially 24 seven monitoring on an organ, right? If you wanna measure oxygen tension of the liver, you can do this. You can build a moat, you can put it on the outside, close everything up, have someone who have a wearable patch, and you can just do this all day. You can look at the, we're doing, uh, this is actually a very limited s cross section. I can pull up the slide. We, we're trying all sorts of things now in terms of what kind of front ends you can put on this. I think there's a very, very big story in chronic monitoring of all sorts of uh, internal, um, sort of internal Fitbit, if you will. Um, and I'm very excited by this, and I'm happy to t tell you more about various efforts we're, we're doing um, on this front. This is just to wrap up. It's just a, a sort of a prop, sort of sending, a, you know, kind of um, credit to Bernhard Boser's group, who has built that ama amazing chip that I used. Uh, and this chip actually is, is really nice. It allows us to actually do the beam forming. And we, this was that EMBC paper I talked about at the very first or second slide. So we have a very nice method now to do sort of beam forming. And I will tell you. Beyond this, um, now a lot of companies are getting into the game building uh, these focusable ultrasonic chips for commercial applications, not sort of the classic HIFU medical ones. There's some really interesting commercial low power chips that are coming out of two or three companies. And so we see kind of a gold rush in terms of the accessible ICs that you'll be able to just get your hands on and do development work for this kind of thing from the external side. So I think it's, it's a great time uh, to be doing all this, here is a, a kind of thank you to all the uh, people that do all sorts of great things. And with that, thank you for putting up with me talking very fast. I think I just made it. Yep. All right. I have like one minute left, right? <laughs> yes, sir. So the existing setup. Um, you send sound, of course, to the moat and the back scatters. Yep. Does it generate any signal at the moat? Because after all, it is hitting DZT, which should absorb that energy and generate some of it. No, it does. It absolutely does. So the, the that's the, so let, hang on. Let me go back to this. So what it does is, there. 
you hit it, the PZT rings up, and essentially it applies a voltage then you know, appears at those electrodes, right? It's a function of how much it's getting slammed. And that voltage becomes the VDS voltage on that FET. What the FET is doing is it's, it is modulating how much current it allows to pass through itself with that VDS voltage across it, which is on order of a volt. Right, so yes, it, there is an electrical signal being, being used. We are, to finish, what Ricky's gonna do is harvest that, store it, and then bang it out as a stimulation through electrodes to do the stimulating mode. So, uh, I knew the answer. So it says that the second question is, even in your setup you have now, are you in any way altering the nerve function? No. Or is the signal just too small? No, it's just too small. I mean, th that we're aware of, we even looked at, we looked at temperature very, very quickly. We don't see any, in, you know, in heating even. I know that's not what you asked, but just, and now we're working with the FDA. So the FDA is, is, is embarking on a series of experiments with the moats to see whether they can do more subtle, like how much does it actually heat and does it do anything. So the real uh, responsible answer to that is, over the next few years, we are now embarking in, in trials with them to validate that. But to our quick look, uh, we don't see anything. Tell a little more about where things stand with regard to recording potentials in cerebral cortex, yeah. which you started with. Yes, yes. So uh, wh where we are right now is um, we, have, we have implanted st uh, stuff. Well, we've, we've put something on the top of the cortex and implanted a very small process and used the neural dust you know, to try to record. But there's a debate going on. Some of this is sort of, I have to be careful, we'll do it after the talk, because some of this is sort of pre-publication, but there's a debate about how long we want to wait for the smallest moat versus you know, getting a couple of these things recording either ECOG or through a, a tiny electrode. But the short version is, um, I think we'll have credible CNS recordings uh, in 2017, um, and then it's a question of how we want to package that and, and what interest areas there are. Because CNS can mean a lot of things. So if you mean penetrating, right? If you're coming in through the cortex, you're going to want to make that really small. You really want the 100 micron moat. Or, you know, no one's going to put a millimeter you know, size thing and shove it into the cortex. So, but then you have these sort of more strategic questions like, do I want to bother tasking someone to take a one millimeter or 500 micron hub with a, you know, maybe carbon fiber or something and just show that I can operate that. And that's, we're kind of deciding that right now. So we, we, are, we have protocols approved and we have experiments that have been carried out. We can see signal. The question now is how to, how, what's the optimal way to sort of unroll these results? But if there's interest in that, I'd be happy to talk afterward. Because um, it, it certainly will work. So it's just a question of how we proceed to that. So you alluded to this when you brought up the slide as well with regard to sort of the conductivity of, of the bag of salt water. Yeah. Right? Uh, you bring this dimension down, the conductivity of those two terminals, the conducting between them, is relatively high, the effective conductance. So what kind of voltage spikes at the source are you looking to record? How do they end up registering as v-neural? What, what's the level of the source that you're looking for and what V neural, do you end up seeing and being able to pick up with the system? Yeah, that's a subtle uh, question. And real quick, remind me to go back. Let's, let me follow up with you about skulls and stuff, because I also didn't do justice to the fact that there's a skull there, but we can give you our solutions to that. Uh, back to this. So um, that's actually kind of an involved, if you do electrophysiology, it's kind of an involved question. There's no easy answer to that. So uh, the, the answer for this is that we, we are pressed right up against the epineurium. So we are as close as you can get uh, without penetrating the epineurium to get the compound action potential. And experimentally, one knows what those will look like and what magnitude they have, and that's what you see here. Um, it gets more involved if you have a, a collection of neurons in which you're kind of snaking some sort of electrode into, either, for example, in cortex or other processes or even the nerve, if I punctured the epineurium and I'm in there. There, really, uh, the most trustworthy stuff is empirical. So if you talk to a practitioner of this, they will tell you, when, you know, at best in this preparation with this type of electrode, you're going to expect to see, you know, 100 microvolt if you're really lucky or you know, whatever. I mean, they vary. These numbers can vary. But as a rule, certainly in cortex, you have to have a noise floor of about, I would say, on order of 2 to 5 microvolts, 10 if you're permissive uh, on, a, on a 5, 10, 15 kilohertz bandwidth, or you're not going to, you're going to miss a lot of the stuff that these, these practitioners want. That's the sort of... I know that's not quite exactly the first principles answer you want because there isn't a good one. I mean, there are very good models of nerves, and you can ask questions in these models of, as I put an electrode farther and farther, you know, how does it drop off exponentially? And for 
a particular size of it, diameter of an axon, unmyelated, doing this and that, what kind of voltage I'll see. You can look those up, and I can point you to the literature. But as a first order answer, it's, a, it's experimental, it's empirical. You know, you know that if you're going into M1, you need this level of, you know, these sizes of, of signal. Yeah? Okay. Ask me after. If it's, it sounds like you're convinced, but if you want, I can follow up. Yeah. Uh, I just have a question about longevity. Like, it seems shoving like a hundred micron thing is really no different than shoving a Utah array in there. In terms of, you can have the same kind of encapsulation problems. You can try yes. to go to the biomaterials. Right. And they look at that. All right. Let me answer that. It's a great question. So. Uh, First of all, remember I said this is part of the issue. So I think what we've solved is the untethered part. And I do think that is already uh, going to have a huge advantage over something like either a Utah array or the peripheral equivalent, OK? So it is absolutely untethered. You don't have any of this micromotion. You don't have routes to infection. You don't have large processes. So the size and the untetheredness by itself are a win. But you're absolutely right. In fact, I, I led with that at the beginning that you have all this material stack stuff. One thing I didn't talk about because it's a different talk is that we have a whole parallel effort now that's working rather well in uh, encapsulating this in uh, very different materials. So we have a, an inert ceramic that we're going to be building and encapsulating these things out of that will get rid of the problems you have with polymers. So to first order, this is a very rough thing, but to first order you have two problems with all of this delamination and material degradation. The first one is that many systems have polymers as insulators, and that's a bad idea. Uh, no polymer in the world will uh, resist water penetration eventually, either through the, the polymer film or as a function of interface delamination where the polymer stops and you're, you peak out your conductor. Um, people have tried all sorts of things like multiple layer, um, atomic layer deposition things. You know, Gary Federer has tried this, a number of people borrowing a page from uh, diode work for humidity barriers. But in the end, this is all, in my opinion, okay, it's a losing proposition with a polymer. So you have to switch to something that is not a polymer. The other problem is that um, these systems have to be relatively inert, and there is a problem between the insulator thin film, whether or not it's a polymer, and the, the conductor thin film. There's an interface there. And even if you're not using a polymer, the, that in there, water eventually gets in there and you know, sort of jackhammers it over time, and eventually you start to get problems. And that, that solution, I think I have a solution for. Um, I'm not the only one, so I actually think that I'm not particularly worried about claims to fame in that department. I think that the field is moving forward with that realization. I'm not voicing something prophetic. I think people have realized this. And you will now see that you can uh, build systems with these material stacks that are more robust. There's still work to be done. I'm not trivializing it. But I think that's where it's going. In the case of this type of implant, you have a huge advantage. Because there's this old thing that I call Flynn's Law, uh, which is basically it's always a connector problem. Anybody who's an EE should know that anything you ever have is a connector problem. Let's, let's call it Anita Flynn's Law, because I know Anita, and she's been saying that since the mid-'80s. And so uh, the, pro the beauty of this is you got, I mean, it sounds like a trivial thing, but this by itself is, I think, a great solution for that reason. You're just really doing away with all of those issues that produce lifetime problems. You know, we were part of the, uh, um, through Corterra, we were part of the early phase of the subnets DARPA thing. And you could see the amount, when you're building a real class three implantable, the amount of pain on the cabling and the implants and all of that stuff is just a damn nightmare, right? And so I, I do think that you're correct uh, in uh, pointing that out. But I do think that with the right material stack and this approach, I think you, you, know, you have a, just a different beast. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, Paul. Awesome. Uh, I guess kind of following on top of that, what kind of mode spacing do you require? Uh, so the naive answer is lambda, because that's your focus size. And so I mo mentioned that these things were dequeued, which means I can't do frequency binning very well. So I'm, I'm sort of relegated to spatial binning. And spatial binning can happen in one of two ways. Either I beam steer so my focus spot jumps around between moats, in which case I, you know, if my focus size naively is lambda, you can play tricks and make it better, but let's assume it's lambda, then your, your moats can't be closer than that. And if you're a good engineer, you'll make it too lambda, so there's a gap in between. The other way to do it is you wash all of them, you capture all the backscatter, and then you do pattern recognition on all that to disambiguate different moats. And th th that is the same, because if you're closer than lambda, the, f the return sort of time of flight difference is so minimal that it's hard to pick out different features. So that's a very quick answer, but that's effectively the engineering answer. So do you, do you always imagine there'll be an external ultrasound generator? Yeah. Or can you implant it? Because long term, you want something completely autonomous, completely cosmetically acceptable. Right. 
Yeah, no, you could you could implant it, I suppose. I mean, it's not something we're pursuing. I, 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 there, the only issue with implant would be uh, power dissipation. So we'd have to think about whether that's, I'm not suggesting it is a problem, I just haven't thought about it. So I'd hate to say yes, and you know, I'd rather, rather be pessimistic. Um, but we're not, we're, we're going for sort of patch or wearable solutions. But yeah, it's a good point. It could be that you could do that. Yeah. Sorry, one more question. Um, if you're going through the skull, you notice you have uh, much more power loss through bone. Yeah. Have you done any, uh, like on the rat static nerve, you're just going through muscle and tissue? Yeah. 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 So this is a sort of point I want to follow up. So we avoided all of the bones. Bone, it's, it's a scattering problem, right? I mean, there's absorption, but it's also a scattering problem. We avoided that issue, and that, I mean, obviously, that's why we did this first, because it's accessible. Um, the answer with bone is, um, I, I, I want to be careful here, because we're still cooking this up. So this is still a little bit like, I'm going to keep my cards close to my chest. But I will say that you can, take a, a, you can borrow a page from uh, people that do stimulating ultrasound and look for windows. Um, you could consider uh, making very small, very, very small hole and just uh, putting in an a, a external transducer. And you could consider not going all the way through the skull, but part way, so that you don't actually uh, go through the skull all the way and create this sort of barrier to infection, but you get close enough that you have a very thin bony membrane left behind and you drop your transducer inside. So there are, there are, there are solutions to that. There is, now, and I, but I don't think one of them is you know, going into the thickest part of the skull and turning your transducer up. I don't think that's a solution, in case anyone's wondering. I could be wrong. I don't think so. So I, I'm sure there are many more uh, questions from the audience. Please feel free to uh, speak to uh, Michelle afterwards. Yeah. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Michelle. Thank you for having me.